our aim is both not to help dogs because they are having the epilepsy and to at the same time get information that in the future could potentially help uh, humans. So up to 18% of dogs can have epilepsy and many of them are on the same anti-seizure medications as us humans. But also, like us, about 30% of them also have refractory epilepsy. And that is why it's really exciting to have veterinary neurologist Rodrigo Guterres Quintana with us this week to learn of his study with David Henshaw, who we featured last week, into helping treat dogs and hopefully humans in the future with refractory epilepsy using microRNAs. Hello, thank you very much for the invitation first. So, uh, my name is Rodrigo Gutierrez Quintana and I work at the University of Glasgow. Interestingly, I'm a veterinarian, so I work in the small animal hospital, working with dogs and cats mainly, and I do veterinary neurology. So I see dogs and cats that are referred by other veterinarians that have neurological conditions. That is such a specialization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it takes a bit of time. So I did vet school, then I did kind of an internship, and then I did three, four years of veterinary neurology. What has led you to, well, obviously, neurology, epilepsy, I get it, but what has led you to uh, focus on the epilepsies? Um, you've got you've got a, a project that you're working on, but what led you to the epilepsy? So we're interested in the epilepsies because uh, canine epilepsy is the most common neurological disease that affects dogs. How common is it? It depends a little bit on the on the breeds and things. For example, there are some breeds where it's very common. It's around 18 per, up to 18 percent can be affected. In others, it's much lower. Wow! But uh, it ends up being that is the most common disease that we see in the clinic. No? So that's why we are interested. And uh, one of the things is that uh, it has some similarities to human epilepsy. No? It can be frustrated to treat because uh, around one third of epileptic dogs will be refractory to the common anti-seizure medications that we use in dogs. So that means that their quality of life is not great and also their owners not have a, a hard time having an, an epileptic dog. And so if their seizures aren't um, controlled, I understand it's about 30%, right? Just like with humans, yeah. Then do people often have their dogs put down? What happens? Yeah, unfortunately, there are some cases in which the owners make that hard decision. No, it's, it's really something personal. What makes it very hard is that usually there are dogs that, that yes, don't have a good time when they're having so many seizures, but in between, there are happy dogs that are doing okay. No, So that's what makes it really hard. In other conditions, then it's not as hard because, you know, they are really not having a good time all the time. But here, what makes it harder is that they can be good and then they have these episodes where they are not doing well. Tell us a little bit about how you, well, you are working internationally with a a uh, fellow professional in Ireland. Tell us how that came about. That's interesting because that was uh, one day that I was working on clinics, seeing dogs uh, with seizures. I had a frustrating day where there was a couple of cases that were not doing well. And uh, I said, we need to find something else. No, I was frustrated and said, I need to find if there is something new, something different that we can do to treat epilepsy. And then I started looking in the literature. I look at different papers. And I found uh, David's uh, publications and I said, oh, that's really interesting because they're looking at a completely different way of treating epilepsy, you know, by blocking these microRNAs and things. So I said, that's, that's cool, that has potential. So I said, I'm going to send an email. I didn't know if David was going to answer. I know that many academics are very busy and things, so I, I didn't know what was going to happen. So I sent an email. And David answered immediately, and he said he was really interested in the, the fact that I was a vet, that I was working with dogs with epilepsy. And little by little, we continue chatting, discussing through emails, and then we finally met and we said, maybe we should try to do something together, because he has done so much on those treatments in rats, mice, in the lab. Then uh, he said, maybe it's time to try something else, and uh, maybe you're your patients, the dogs, the pet dogs, we could organize a clinical trial and see if that can help uh, can help dogs. And at the same time, we can get information uh, to, to help humans in the future. So that's how 
everything happened. Yeah. And so the idea here is with the with this um, research is for the research itself to benefit both humans potentially, but and the dogs directly. Yeah, exactly. So, and I think that's one of the advantages, no? Because uh, there is lots of research that happen in the lab, that happen in lab animals that never end up what we call translating. So never end up working in the clinic in, in humans. No? Mm. And uh, one of the big problems is that many of the, the ways they cause seizures in the labs, animals are not really natural. No, they, they, they need to give things for animals to seizure, what is not what happened in the, in the clinic, no, in humans. And uh, the advantage is that dogs can have epilepsy naturally as it happens in humans. No, we don't know exactly why, but there is a group of dogs that will develop seizures and they will develop chronic seizures that are difficult to treat and things. So we thought that's great in a way to help humans, no? because it's kind of an intermediate step. They already know a lot in the lab, but maybe not enough to start clinical trials in humans. So maybe doing the clinical trials in dogs, if we're lucky and everything works, we can show first that whatever we want to give is safe. And second, that there is uh, some evidence that it could work on the, on control seizures. So the, our aim is both not to help dogs because they are having the epilepsy, and to at the same time get information that in the future could potentially help uh, humans. It's really exciting. And so dogs are far more complex than say mice or rats, right? And I guess that's why they testing on them or like research using using dogs could is potentially likely to be more beneficial, fingers crossed, for humans. Exactly. So there are, there are multiple advantages, no? So as you said, just the anatomy, no? Like the brain of a rat or a mice is flat, no? They don't have circumvolutions, it's much smaller. The brain of a dog is much more similar to the one of a human. There's still a gap or difference, but it's much more similar. So that's one of the big advantages. The other advantage is that uh, dogs live with their owners. No? So if you think about uh, they are exposed to the same things that we are exposed at home, outside, they sometimes eat the same food. <laughs> Whether they have permission or not. <laughs> so th there's lots of things that are, that are similar. And the other thing is that uh, also epileptic dogs are already on the on anti-epileptic medications and that's exactly the case in, in humans on some of the medications that we use in dogs are the same that they use in humans no so so all is much more similar that when you're going to be organizing a clinical trial in humans it has all those similarities so it's probably much more close to what will happen if we were doing a clinical trial in human that in the lab that mice are very well controlled, they get all the same food, they, 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 they are in perfect conditions. So that's an advantage initially, because there are lots of things that you can control, but that's a disadvantage in real life because we are all different, we're all not genetically similar. So that, that's, a, that's an advantage. So in dogs, we're gonna be treating dogs of very different breeds and things. No? So, so that also helps to know that uh, that the genetics is going to be still still different, for example. That's amazing. And so I understand that you are going to be injecting something into their cerebral spinal fluid um, at the back of their neck. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. So, so we're going to be injecting a little thing that's going to help to block a molecule that is an, an RNA that we have in the brain. And David uh, has done lots of research to show that it affects the connection between the neurons, no? So you can imagine if we help that connection to work better, maybe we can help uh, controlling the seizures. So what we will be doing is we're gonna be anesthetizing the dogs. And uh, under anesthesia, we're gonna do an injection in the, into the cerebrospinal fluid. So it's something that we do very commonly when we do the investigation of seizures in dogs. So it's a routine procedure collecting that cerebrospinal fluid. The only difference is that here, we're going to be injecting the the medication directly to the to the cerebrospinal fluid and then after that we're going to be following them no so the owners will have a very strict uh, diary of seizures before we start the trial 
and then they're going to continue having that diary of seizures after the trial. Then they're going to come specific days for us to do checkups, make sure that there's no side effects, that they are doing well, taking blood samples to make sure that all the values, all the parameters are okay, and measuring little things that we want to measure to see if the medication has had some kind of effect. And just to reassure everybody, when it comes to involving these dogs in the trial, how are they cared for? Are there specific rules, uh, regulations that you're adhering to? No, that's a very good question because uh, the all the regulations here in the UK are very strict. No, So we had to take uh, to write exactly what we wanted to do on the we are controlled by the home office to make sure that we're following every rule that we don't do anything that we shouldn't be doing. Wow. So well, the safety of the dogs is the most important thing for us. So for example, we start with a low dose. Uh, first, we're just treating a very small number of dogs. If there is any side effect, any problems, we need to stop the trial. We need to inform the home office. And then we need to investigate to know what happened before we're able to to continue. No? So the safety of all the dogs in the study is the most important thing. Here. That's very reassuring. And so, what are the next steps in your work? Uh, how? Like, when do you like properly start it? What's going to happen? So the trial started uh, properly last month. So it was a month ago that we recruited the first case. So for the moment, we have treated two dogs and uh, as it's a blinded trial, so I don't know what they got. The owners don't know what they got. Some some of them is going to get the medication. Some of them are going to get a placebo for us to be able to know if there is a difference. The good thing is that even dogs that get the placebo at the end of the study will be offered the medication if they want it, no? so that there is a bit of a potential benefit and they will know at that point how much information we have up to that point. So for the moment, we have two dogs. And what I'm very happy to say is the procedure, so all has gone really well in both cases. Uh, they ha we haven't seen any side effects in any of them. So if they got, they still got a low dose. So that's still very early days. But we're very happy that there hasn't been any side effects. Then regarding the seizures, it's hard to know. No, it's too early to know. Like one of the dogs hasn't had any difference in seizure frequency. The other dog hasn't seizure, but sometimes has these periods where he doesn't seizure and then he starts again. It's very early days to know if there is any evidence of the anything happening, but we are very happy to know that there's still no, no side effects on all this progressing work. Well. Yeah, and how many dogs do you look to have involved in this? Yeah, so the aim will be to recruit between 25 to 30 dogs for us okay. to have an idea. So it's it's comparable to what they call phase one, phase two trials in humans, no? where you start to see that it's safe, to see if there is some evidence of efficacy. So it's, it's still low numbers just for us to know uh, that it's safe and if there is a hint that it's working. It may work, uh, the other thing that we're thinking, so it may work just for for a specific group of dogs. And that's why we're taking the blood samples, no? because it may be that uh, this molecule that we want to block is higher in some dogs. And for them, this makes a difference. So it's still very early to know if it's going to work for everyone, if it's going to work for a specific group of dogs, for example. Oh, it's a really exciting time. So, and so this is going to last sort of between, t well, two, three years at the moment, right? Yeah, so the aim will be to recruit the cases within two years, hopefully. So uh, if you know anyone that has an epileptic dog that is interested, we are recruiting and we're very happy to speak with anyone. No? So that's uh, that's one of the things with any trial is always recruitment, you know, that can take uh, take some time and things. So. I don't have an animal, but if I did, I was uh, who had an epilepsy, a, a small dog, I would totally get them involved in this. Um, that brings hope to your own individual dog, but also to the species as a whole. Um, and then if you care about humans, it might help the humans in the future as well. Um, and it's all exciting stuff. Oh, and also worth mentioning is, because you told me this before, is that you only need to give the injection like once every, how many months is it? Yeah, so that's something interesting that David has found in their studies that uh, 
With a single injection, they have good control of seizures for as long as they follow some of the mice that was two, three months. So uh, that uh, makes you think that probably a single injection will work for at least three months, if not more. There's a little chance that who knows, maybe a, an injection can reset everything and help forever, but uh, what is still very early days to know, no? Like, uh, for the moment, what we're gonna do is we're gonna give a single injection to the dogs and follow them, you know, to see what's happening for up to six months. Wonderful. Well, thank you for telling us all about this. And um, I do hope to receive an update soon from you, Rodrigo. Um, everyone can relate to what you're doing, whether you're a human uh, or, or a dog, dog lover or both. <laughs> thank you so much for your time. No, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you so much to Rodrigo for sharing with us his exciting and quite frankly cool research into epilepsy in both dogs and humans.